Hey again, everybody. Today we're going to introduce the Poisson process, uh, a major player in the Markov processes world. We're going to use it a whole bunch in the next couple of applications, so it's, it's worth spending some time and making sure we have a, a fairly solid understanding of it. We're going to give three different definitions, or at least seemingly different definitions. Uh, they've got little bits that seem like they might be a little... Um, that, they, that they could make the things, uh, the definitions different from each other. But they're all equivalent, and, and we'll spend some time um, giving a strong motivation slash proof uh, of why they're all equivalent to each other. And we're going to finish with a discussion of a particular application to physics. Um, there was a mystery a while back, about 100 years ago or so, about a particle that rains down on the Earth all the time from space that seemed to be living a lot longer than it should. Um, it was, it was understood that it had a relatively short lifetime in the laboratory, but the ones that were coming down from space seemed to be living a lot longer, and there was this mystery for a while. The Poisson process plays a role in understanding um, the arrival of those particles on Earth, um, um, and it was important in understanding um, the full story uh, that eventually led to an explanation of what was going on. Um, We'll give the resolution of that mystery as well. Uh, it turns out to involve relativity. Uh, anyways, that's just for fun. That's just our application. But so today is all about the Poisson process, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. All right, so the topic of the day is the Poisson process. named after a person, not a fish. And this is a process that um, it's heavily used. Um, in fact, it's probably, it's probably safe to say it's overused. Um, the reason for this is uh, relatively straightforward. So, so let's just describe it here. So it's a, it's a Markov process, Markov process. that's used for counting, a specific type of counting, really. It's used for counting similar events uh, over a given time interval. So used for counting uh, similar events over specified time intervals. And essentially, it's overused because, I think, first of all, because it works really well, and it's very handy. Um, but I think it's overused because basically, th there's almost an, you know, there's an unimaginably infinite number of different things that involve counting, uh, counting of similar events. So examples that you'll see uh, in the notes, maybe or elsewhere are like, uh, an event could be like a user clicking on an advertisement. Um, and maybe you want to count how many of those come every two days or something like that, or every, or what about every hour or something like that. And so uh, the idea is that we have, we're going to have our process, uh, it's going to be n of t. And that's going to be the number of events in some interval. So that's the number of events. In this, in the interval zero to t. All right. So starting at time zero, n of t is how many of these, in this case, clicks happened over the time zero to t, um, and then we want to make a a, a process uh, that describes this, a Markov process. Um, and so you can you can also use this then to compute uh, the number of events over other intervals just by taking differences. So uh, and we'll do that a lot. So like n of b minus n of a uh, is the number of events in the interval a to b. I think this one's open on that side. 
could, could have got that wrong, but let's not worry about that right now. Um, and so this is a way to, to use the same process to give you interval uh, counts or, or uh, number of events in, in some other interval. We call these increments. Uh, Uh, when we look at differences like this, um, the increments, how much do we increment the number of counts by or number of events by. So anyways, there's, there's all kinds of things that you could think of that this might apply to. Um, uh, an example that, that we're going to touch on at the end is um, particles uh, smashing into a detector. If they're raining down all over the place, uh, an event could be that a particle actually uh, strikes the detector. Uh, and then you want to use uh, some kind of a method to count those. Uh, and a Poisson process is a, is a good tool, uh, or at least seemingly. It turns out the Poisson process is really good for uh, that particle physics example, or at least it will be for the one that we're going to discuss. And it also turns out that it's uh, quite bad, uh, apparently, uh, so I'm told, for modeling clicks on advertisements. Uh, people have tried this, uh, tried to use it uh, much to their peril, I'm told. Um, but so you can imagine no, anything we want to count similar events like this, uh, if, it's, if any such thing is a candidate, uh, this is a tool that's sort of bound to be overused. So you could describe today's lecture as uh, the tale of three definitions. All right, so we're going to see three different definitions or seemingly different definitions of a Poisson process. And they're all the same. They're all equivalent to each other. Um, and so let, let's just start with the first one here. Definition number one of three, all equivalent to each other. Uh, but let's see sort of how, how these things look. Um, so we're going to say that, and the first piece of this definition is going to be the same for all of them. So we're going to copy them over. Uh, but we're going to say, so this the Poisson process is a process uh, that we call N of t. Uh, such that t is positive, it's greater than or equal to zero, and it's a real number. Oops. Um, and it takes on non-negative integer values. Let me fix up that real, that's pretty bad. A little better. Uh, taking non-negative integer values. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Uh, and then we say of rate lambda. Um, and that's a positive. Uh, that's greater than 0. Um, that's a, it's a number greater than 0. Uh, so that's the way we characterize uh, the Poisson process with this rate parameter. Um, and then all three definitions are going to have this part. We're going to require. Uh, that n at time zero, this process at time zero, is equal to zero. So it's just a, a conventional uh, uh, rule that we're going to insist on. Um, and then they differ uh, in the next uh, two. So remember, this is just a process. Uh, it's not necessarily a Markov process yet. Uh, it turns out that it is. Um, but so let's see part two of this definition. Um, we're going to say something about the increments. So we're going to say, let's, let's lay out a sequence of increments. Uh, so we'll say n at t1 minus n at t0. Uh, that's a, one increment. And there's another increment. So let's say n at t2 minus n at t1. So these t's are times. Um, um, and then you can make a sequence of these things. So all these these e increments So this collection of, of increments um, These are all independent uh, for any increasing collection of T's uh, they increase with the order of the index All right, so we'll say uh, these are independent For any any t's that obey the following. So t0 is smaller than t1, uh, or t1 is bigger than t0, uh, t2 uh, is bigger than t1, 
uh, T3 is bigger. I don't think I have a T3 up there, so I better stop. Um, but and so on. So all the T's, the index uh, goes in order of the size of those times. Uh, so that's one of the pieces of this definition. And then the third and final piece of this definition uh, involves the Poisson distribution, uh, which is a separate thing from the Poisson process. Uh, it's important to remind yourself of that. Uh, it says that this this increment, this sort of generic looking increment that goes from uh, s to s plus t. Uh, this increment or any increment of this form is Poisson distributed with parameter, and I remember there's a free parameter for the Poisson distribution, uh, lambda times t. Uh, oftentimes the parameter, uh, when you're writing out the Poisson distribution, uh, the parameter that you use is actually called lambda. So there's a little, there's a chance of some confusion here. So be a little bit careful here. Um, uh, where lambda, again, is greater than zero. That's the rate, remember. Um, and this is true for all s and t uh, greater than or equal to zero. All right, so that's definition number one. Um, we don't insist that it's a Markov process. It turns out to be one. Um, and so let's just make a couple of notes here about that. Um, so notes the following. Um, first of all, um, the the second property here, uh, this guy here, um, this thing uh, assures that the process is memoryless. Uh, you might have to think about that for a while uh, to convince yourself of it, uh, but so property two uh, implies that the process is memoryless. which is enough to make it a Markov process uh, from our definition of Markov process. process uh, part three, though, uh, get, makes it a Markov process that we're allowed to consider in this class. Um, part three, uh, which says that these things are Poisson distributed, these increments, regardless of what the S is. Um, this says uh, that it's homogeneous. Oops. So these things give us the uh, Markov, uh, these things reveal the Markov nature of this process. Um, and I just wanna make a couple of other remarks. So first of all, um, I, should, I should have done this before, but let's just make you a reminder. Uh, so, so remember, um, if you have a variable that's Poisson distributed, uh, how do I wanna write it? Let's say it's, uh, uh, just some some random variable x, um, and it's Poisson distributed with free parameter. Let's call it alpha, so we don't mix up with the the heavily used lambda up above. We don't want to make it any more overloaded than it already is. Um, this is I just want to remind you what the Poisson distribution looks like because it's sort of it's easy to get this tangled up here. Uh, if you have this uh, a random variable that's Poisson distributed, so it's a discrete random variable then, and uh, it, this means that the probability mass function, or rather the probability that x is equal to k, um, if your free parameter is alpha, uh, this is equal to alpha to the k uh, times e to the minus alpha divided by k factorial. Right, so that's the PMF probability mass function for the Poisson distribution. Um, and also uh, the expected value and the variance are actually the same. Uh, so that's one of the interesting aspects of the Poisson distribution. Oops. And these are actually equal to that same parameter or that single parameter alpha. Uh, so you might want to go back and remind yourselves of that if you don't remember that, but you probably do. Um, and so in our case, if if our increments here um, are Poisson distributed with parameter lambda t, what this means is that the expected number of uh, the expected increment uh, in this particular time interval, anything going from s to s plus t, so this this stuff implies 
uh, that the expected value in our case for how do I want to write this um, n of s plus t minus n of s so what would that have to be equal to so that increment is Poisson distributed with rate parameter or sorry with parameter lambda t and so this is lambda times t and so what you see is that the expected uh, increase in this particular interval is just proportional to t and it, the proportionality factor is lambda and so that's the origin of of calling this uh, lambda uh, the rate parameter for the process um, there's one other thing i want to mention here um, which is um, that th this is a markov process so what we have is a markov process where the state uh, if state i plus one Oops. Whoa. Come on, pen. State i plus 1 is the only state you can go into immediately from, or transition into immediately from state i. Uh, so is, uh, is the only state transition to, bit of a clumsy sentence, From state i so in other words you go up in increments of one you don't go from state uh, 4 to state 12 uh, you go from 4 to 5 and then to 6 and so on you can eventually get to 12 but that you go in order like that all right so let's have a look at our second definition uh, so again this is definition 2 of 3 it, it takes on the initial part of it takes on the same setup uh, so I'm just gonna steal this and just change that 1 to a 2 um, uh, the third definition has that same structure too. Um, so let's move this over here. So the second definition we're going to look at has the same initial uh, property that we start. Uh, so it's a process. It has this rate parameter lambda, and we start with n equals zero. Um, the other two are a little bit different though. Uh, so the second one, oops, wrong color. The second property. Uh, is that we say that n of t uh, gives the number of events in the increment zero in the interval zero to t. So this is one of the, the descriptors that we saw earlier on. Uh, so n of t gives the number of events, or in other words, it gives some number that goes along with uh, the interval. 0 to t. All right. And the third part is that we say that the inter event times uh, which are the sojourn times, the time it takes to go from one event to the next. So maybe we should even write that. just to remind you of the terminology. Uh, so these, these times are identically independently distributed. So I, I, D. Um, and their distribution is exponential uh, with parameter lambda, the rate parameter for the Poisson process. All right, and so in case you'd forgotten, this means that the probability mass function is lambda times e to the minus lambda t. We just used this in the last lecture, so that should be pretty familiar. And of course, lambda is positive. Uh, that's part of the initial requirement, so on. All right, so that's definition number two. Uh, it looks similar, uh, all right? And then I think I've still got in my copy clipboard, I can just paste again. Yeah. So we can look at our third definition, which again starts out the same. 
um, but has the next two parts are different. All right, so for the third definition, uh, we say that the again these we have this increment uh, this independent increments thing. So this part actually comes back to where is it here. Uh, so we're going to take this same thing. So this bit is as part of definition number three. So a bit of mix and match going on here, but its third part is different. And the third part of this guy is a sort of a technical limit statement, All right? So we're going to say that the limit as h goes to zero of the following ratio. So the probability that n of t plus h minus n of t Oops, sorry. The probability that this difference, difference is one, this limit, as you shrink h, is equal to lambda. And again, that's positive, greater than zero. And we say there is at most one event in such an infinitesimal interval. This interval when you shrink h down to zero. Okay, so these are our three definitions. Uh, so there's the three parts for definition number three. Uh, and this one, so sometimes it's a good idea to kind of name these. Um, you don't always have to memorize these kinds of things, but if someone ever asked you to, it's a good idea to kind of think about what are the differences here. So this one, uh, I like to think of as the independent increments. <laughs> Uh, with this funny uh, limit statement. Uh, the next one, uh, the definition number two, I like to think of this as uh, the IID uh, inter-event times. Being exponential. Uh, with parameter lambda. I guess I should put that in there, huh? Why not? Uh, so it's just a shorthand reminder of what these definitions are. Um, and then the first one, I just like to remind myself, this is independent increments uh, are Poisson distributed. And remember, these are all equivalent. So all these things actually hold um, for all of them. Uh, but uh, so so you can you can go between these three these three different definitions. Uh, but it's it's nice to kind of think of these uh, to give them sort of like shorthand reminders of what these definitions are. Okay, I think I I want to make a couple of comments uh, about these different definitions. So um, the first thing is. Um, the, the the first definition, so let me just make some more remarks here or notes. Um, the first definition there, so definition number one of three, uh, if we go back and take a look at that. So this one explains kind of the origin of the name of the process because uh, this this property number three here, uh, says that this increment uh, from a, a t length increment is Poisson distributed. 
uh, with parameter lambda t. So that's the origin of the name. So that's why this is called the Poisson process. So definition one of three, uh, part three, is the origin of the name. So that particular property. Um, and then uh, definition number two, it's a little bit, it's not so transparent, I think, to see this, but it is the case and might be interesting for you to know. So definition uh, number two, so let's go back here and have that up on the screen. Um, this one, it turns out, is a particularly handy way uh, of thinking about the Poisson process um, or a Poisson process when doing simulations um, and when doing testing. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it's uh, obvious uh, to see here, uh, but it, it is the case. Um, so maybe the fact that you can see, you know, the fact that this is explicit, uh, this is number of events in zero to t, um, and that this guy, uh, these times are exponentially uh, distributed. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to make uh, one other remark, uh, which is that you can, so there's another, there's an alternate way uh, of making this statement here. Um, and I think you'll see this in your notes somewhere, uh, but I'm going to make an alternate statement of that uh, just for the heck of it. Uh, so you can see this. There's a sort of a special notation that's used. Uh, so an alternative, like an alternative wording or something, or alternative version of that limit statement. in, what was it, uh, definition three of three. I think it's part three of that. Um, so the alternative version looks like this. You can say that the probability of this increment, so n of t plus h minus n of t equaling one is equal to lambda times h plus, let me write, this is meant to be a little o, lowercase o, of h. As h goes to zero. So we don't write it as, I should probably make that a distinguishing zero, not an o. Um, so we don't write it as a limit, instead we, we say this thing. But this is actually a limit statement just sort of hidden. Um, so this is a special notation. This is the so-called little o notation. Uh, which for our purposes just has one meaning. It means the following thing. If you have some, let's say you have two functions, um, f of x and another one, g of x, we say that f of x is equal to little o g of x as x goes to a. That's always part of the statement. If the following limit is true, The ratio of f to g is equal to zero. Right. So that's just a uh, a funny notation. Uh, this little o notation that you'll see sometimes. Um, and so, in sort of plain language, what this means is that uh, little f falls off faster than g as you approach A. This is maybe more of a, uh, I don't know, maybe more of a physicist language uh, to say a function falls off like this. So it falls off faster than G as X approaches A. Uh, so this is sort of maybe just sort of a bit of interesting trivia or maybe not interesting trivia but you might you might find that interesting 
All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of proof uh, here, or at least a sketch, um, and we'll sort of strongly motivate this proof. So I want to try to prove, so proof or sketch, sketch of proof. that the definitions are equivalent. Right? Um, and the sketch, it's kind of simple. Know, maybe it's a little cute. I don't know. Um, so the idea is there's going to be three parts to this proof. Uh, so that we're going to have part one of the proof. And part one is going to show that definition one implies definition two. All right, and then part two of the proof is going to show that definition two implies definition three. And then, as you might have guessed, in the last part says that definition three implies definition one. Oops. So you've got these three different definitions, uh, one, two, and three. And if one implies two, and sorry, that's really clumsy. Um, if one implies two, and if two implies three, and if three implies one, uh, they all they all imply each other. Uh, so it's a sort of a proof by circle or proof by triangle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's go ahead and look at that. So let's dive into this proof. Um, so we'll work in order, uh, doing part one, then two, and then three. So part one, uh, we want to show. We want to show that definition one out of three goes points uh, implies uh, two out of three, or two of three. All right. So this is the goal here. All right. So first thing I want to do uh, is so consider the first sojourn. So let's look look back at these definitions. Um, one goes to two. Right. So one. Here we go. Looks like this. Uh, so we can we can use uh, we can use this guy here. Uh, we could use these increments. Um, we'll use the Poisson distribution. Is what we're going to do. Um, and then we want to try to get that to turn into this guy over here, uh, which results in uh, sojourn times having exponential uh, distributions. So that's the idea. Uh, we want to link those two things. Um, all right, um, and so we're going to say so. Uh, consider the first sojourn time, w sub zero. It works similarly for all the other ones. All right, and so we'll say this is the probability that w sub zero is greater than t. This is equal to the probability that n of t is greater than zero. Keep in mind that the, the Poisson process is monotonically increases. Um, so you can't go away from zero and then come back. Um, OK, and so that we, we can write that probability as the complement one minus the probability that n is equal to zero, n of t is equal to zero. And then, so we'll use the probability of n being zero, uh, so use Poisson PMF to express n of t equals zero. This is one minus e to the minus lambda t. OK? And that expression is the same thing. That's the solution, the answer to this integral, which we've seen before. 
0 to t integrated over time of lambda times e to the minus lambda x. Oh, sorry, <laughs> integrated over x. All right, and so that means this is this is showing this is the th that means that this guy here is the cumulative distribution function for w sub zero, which means that w sub zero is exponentially distributed with parameter lambda. All right, uh, and then similar for any of the other w's. How do I write that? Similar for wi for i greater than zero, right? You just have to change uh, what happens at that step here, and n of t uh, being greater than zero, and doing the complement thing. Okay, so that's the first step. That's that's the part one of the proof, one one leg of the triangle, if you will. Uh, part two. Let's just steal it from over here. All right, so we want to go from definition two to definition three. Right, and so definition two, uh, we can use this stuff. Um, that's that's part of definition two. Uh, it's kind of its key part. And definition three, um, we're going to use this uh, limit statement, right? Um, so okay, so let's let's do this. So we'll say limit h goes to zero. Uh, so this this limit statement in the definition one over h times the probability that n of t plus h minus n of t is equal to one is equal to and then we'll continue this down on the next line. Right, so this is equal to the same limit of uh, 1 over h, the probability. And now I'm just going to um, strip away the t here. All right, so I'm going to use the fact that these guys are independently, identically distributed um, increment. Uh, or interval times. And so I can, I don't have to, it doesn't matter which one of these I look at, uh, which time, which t I look at, so I can put n, I can put t equals zero, and so I get n of h minus n of zero uh, is equal to one, sorry. And I should probably, maybe, maybe I'll do it like this. Uh, that's what gives me this line here, right? And uh, this is the same thing as. So this is all. One over h. If if this dif distance, or sorry, distance. If this difference is one. Right, that means that w zero is less than h, and remember we're only uh, we're only we only increment positive it, it monotonically here. So um, this is the same thing as saying that the probability of w zero is greater than h, or sorry, not greater than zero. That's definitely true. Greater than h, or sorry, boy, am I a mess. I hope you're all spotting these. You can congratulate yourself. Less than h. <laughs> the sojourn time is smaller than h if you made this increment, right? And, and then we've, we've already seen this up here uh, for, did I make that same mistake up here? I think I probably did. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm gonna fix that now. Boy, I hope you guys caught that. Yeah. The left side was wrong. The right side was okay. Jeez. Okay. Uh, where was I going with this? Oh yeah. So we've <laughs> we've got this probability here uh, that we've already worked out 
uh, using, uh, and, it, and it gives you this, this thing from property, from definition number two. And so we're going to write down that result. All right, so this is the limit. This is this, the sojourn times are exponentially distributed, right? Maybe I should write that. Right, and that's something that's in definition number two. All right, so we have one over H. And we're going to arrive at the same trick that we've, oh, I think we've seen this trick, uh, E to the minus lambda H. Um, and then we put in the uh, Taylor series for the exponential. Uh, have we seen this trick? I think we have. If you put in the Taylor series for the exponential here, it's a famous simple Taylor series. The very first term of it is one, right? And so when you subtract it off, um, this is what we get. Uh, we have lambda h. Uh, you have to be careful with the signs. I hope we've got these right. Minus lambda h squared over 2 factorial. So this is one of the downsides of not being in the classroom. Students will holler out when you make a simple mistake like this. Sometimes I don't catch them for several pages. Um, minus lambda h cubed over 3 factorial. Um, and so on. Um, but when you divide by h and then take the limit that h goes to zero, um, this term's going to go away, this one's going to go away. The only one that's going to survive is this one. Um, and so we're left over with uh, lambda, uh, which was uh, the thing we were looking for uh, at the other end of the limit statement. All right, so that's the proof that 2 implies 3. All right, so let's look at the last leg of this proof. Uh, so this is the part where you link, uh, you show that uh, definition three implies definition one. Uh, so this was, I think we called this part three. Um, and so we're gonna say definition three of three implies definition one of three. All right, um, so this one's a little tricky not too bad actually, but uh, I'm going to leave one piece out uh, because I think some of you might have seen it already and so it'll be old news, uh, but if you haven't you might want to redo it and I'll sort of remind you how it goes. Uh, but the idea is we want to somehow show, uh, so the goal uh, to link, uh, to, to show that uh, definition one is implied, the goal what we want uh, is to show that the following is true. So n of s plus t minus n of s uh, is Poisson distributed with parameter lambda t, um, which is, this, this was, I think it was the third condition in definition one. Uh, so this is what we want to do. Um, so we want to demonstrate this using uh, the conditions of uh, definition three. Right, so here's the, here's the idea. So the first thing you want to do is divide divide up uh, the interval s to s plus t into uh, a bunch of different intervals, into k different intervals. Um, we'll eventually make this number really big. Uh, so and each one has length. So the same size. Um, so each one of them has a length h, which is equal to t over k. So t is the overall length of the main interval. We chop this up uh, into k pieces, right? So you then have uh, k, or you have you have corresponding increments, right? So make corresponding increments. Um, and they look like this. We'll say t sub n is equal to n times h, where n is 0 through k. All 
right? So we have a bunch of these uh, increments, or we have a bunch of these times um, uh, that we'll use to make the increments. Uh, so the increments will be like this, delta n, uh, what we call this, delta n1 is n of t1 minus n of t0. Right, so we saw these increments before. Delta n2, increment number 2, n of t2. So we're trying to reconstruct the conditions in um, in uh, definition number 1, and so on. Right, and then you've got your, your last one is delta nk. Uh, and so that's t minus n of t k minus 1, right? Now, for large enough k, so for large k, um, you get a really, really tiny h, right? So h is really, really small compared to lambda. How do I want to write that? Infinitesimal, my favorite word to misspell. If only my pen would actually write anything. All right, so this thing is tiny um, and you can approximate Um, you can make this approximation, approximation that delta n sub j, say, is Bernoulli distributed. Most of these delta n's, no increment, right? Uh, but uh, you can suppose that there's an increment somewhere in there. Um, and so we'll say these are Bernoulli distributed um, uh, with parameter of probability of success, lambda times h. Um, and so that's the same thing as Bernoulli uh, lambda times t over k, like that. Uh, so it's a simple distribution that we know all about. Um, and then, then we want to talk about, so that's, that's for each individual little increment in this collection, right? But so then if we add up all of those uh, Bernoulli trials, we get a binomial, right? And so uh, let's say the approximation for the total increment uh, it looks like this. So we have like Oops, what happened there? N of S plus T minus N of S. This is the sum of all the increments. J equals one to K of delta N J. All right, and so this will be a binomial distribution. And the number of trials here is k and the parameter the probability of success is lambda times t over k okay and now what you want to try to do is to show that when you make k sufficiently sufficiently big um, this binomial distribution is a Poisson distribution. And that's a sort of a famous result that I suspect you guys might have done, you, you might, might have already proved in an earlier class. Um, but I'll sort of point out how it goes. So, so the idea is, okay, so then show, then finish, show, this is a, a gift to you. Because I think you've already done it. Um, but if you haven't, you want to show the following. So you want to show that the limit of k going to infinity of this binomial, this is actually equal to, or how do we want to say it? I don't want to, it's not equal exactly. Uh, <laughs> how do you say this? Uh, 
something like this. I think that's the right way to say it. <laughs> is Poisson distributed? With parameter lambda t. Um, and, and so the way to go about this, there's lots of different ways you could try to prove this. Um, so the best way to do it is best done with, you guessed it, maybe, uh, probability generating functions. Right? So the binomial probability generating function and the Poisson probability generating functions are ones that you probably know. So if, if you don't remember, so the idea is you say something like this. Say, probability generating function for a Poisson, um, some function of s, right? Um, I don't know if you remember what that is. Uh, we could just write it down. So it's uh, e to the alpha times s minus 1, right? And that's for, uh, how do I write this? For Poisson with parameter alpha. Right, and then the probability generating function. That one you might not have used as much lately. I don't know. Uh, for the binomial, in our case, so it, how does it look? It's uh, it looks like this: one plus p times s minus one uh, to the n. Right, where here p is the probability of success for each of the Bernoulli trials and n is the number of trials, right? And so in our case, what that is, is one plus p is gonna be uh, lambda times t over k. That's written up above there somewhere. Um, so then we have s minus one. And n, the number of trials is k. Okay, so the idea is you want to take this quantity here and take the limit that k goes to infinity, uh, and you want to show, show uh, that it looks like this. All right, uh, where alpha is then uh, lambda times t. So that's the idea. Um, and I think you maybe have done this before. I'm not sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that uh, just as left to you, right? And once you've done that, that completes the proof. You've got You've completed the triangle, so any any one of the things, any one of the definitions implies any one of the other ones. All right, so now we come to the sort of fun, I hope, application, uh, the sort of dessert of the lecture, if you want. Um, so this is an application from physics. Uh, it's called the muon lifetime. A muon is a particle. And I thought I would mention this because for me, it was the first time I encountered the Poisson, a Poisson process. Um, this is an experiment um, that I, as a grad student, when I was a grad student, I verified this experimental result. Uh, we had to choose a bunch of famous experiment from a bunch of famous experiments and try to verify them. And this was one I picked and it was kind of fun. Um, this is not uh, examinable for you. It's just meant to be fun. Uh, this is not a physics class, of course. Um, but so the idea of this experiment or observation or mystery is the following. So suppose you're, you've got uh, space out here, um, there's stars and so on, black holes, mysteries abound, right? So this is space out here. Um, in space, <laughs> In, in uh, empty space, there are a lot of things. Um, so there are a lot of uh, heavy uh, particles that are flying around in space and smashing into the Earth all the time, smashing into everything out there. Um, and so let's just say that you have some very fast uh, nucleus. Nuclei uh, flying around and headed down towards Earth. And so let's say this is the top of the Earth's atmosphere, right? Uh, so this is top of atmosphere. Um, I suppose these would around us are probably mostly coming from the sun, but you could have some things coming from uh, a bit farther away. Um, 
Maybe that's not really so likely, actually. Anyways, that's a separate topic. So these fast nuclei uh, buzzing all around in space. Occasionally one of them, well, not occasionally, really often, um, one collides uh, with the top of the atmosphere. Uh, so this is a collision. All right, so a big, like a helium nucleus or something, smashes into some, uh, to the whatever the diffuse gases are up there in the top of the atmosphere. And a whole bunch of particles are produced in that collision, a big explosion of different particles, one of which, one type of which is called a muon. Um, and so let's draw him in, uh, I don't know, in red. Uh, so we'll say that part of this explosion uh, is a muon. Say so it comes down like that. And the symbol, people label that with a mu. So this is a muon. They label it with just a mu. Um, and then down, so, and the, and the atmosphere is, is busy. You know, there's all kinds of stuff, hence the collision. Um, all kinds of stuff in here. Um, air and so on. <laughs> Airplanes, birds, whatever. Um, and then let's say down here, uh, there's the laboratory, or the surface of the Earth. Right, so this is surface. the earth right so this is solid ground down here and down here you have your laboratory set up set up so this is your lab here and in your lab you have a detector and a detector to pick up a uh, muon is actually pretty simple it's just a um, well, I don't know if it's super simple, but it's a big piece of plastic. It's called a scintillator um, or acrylic or something like that. And the muon goes into this material, hits something in there, um, and uh, it makes a flash in that material of light. And it's like a, uh, like a fiber optic thing where the light gets collected. Um, and then you have some other sequence of circuits that kind of multiplies the amount of light that was collected. So it becomes some signal that you could actually measure. Um, and so that, that's what the detector consists of, this big sort of clear thing, um, and it just makes little flashes that get built up on one side of the detector, built up to something large enough to be able to uh, measure. And so you measure little flashes, right? Um, oh, and it's, it's probably worth saying, um, the muons uh, hit this, uh, leave, leave the surface here, uh, they travel at about the speed of light. Um, and these are things you can figure out by other means, uh, by looking at the amount of energy in the muon when it makes a flash, say. Um, but let's say this is the muon speed um, is approximately the speed of light, which we use uh, the symbol C for that in physics, the speed of light in a vacuum. And from the height of the atmosphere, uh, we can tell that this means that the time it takes for the muon to fall uh, to traverse from the top of the atmosphere down to where your detector is, it turns out this is about uh, 10 to the minus 5 seconds. So that's how long the muon's journey was from the top of the atmosphere down to the laboratory, to about around 10 to the minus 5 seconds. Um, okay, and so in the, in the detector, you measure two different things, all right? So you measure, you stop the muon, and you get a flash. So you stop the muon and let's say you call that time zero and you get a flash. All right, and then you get another flash. So, that, so when, the mu when the first flash happens, the muon actually stops. It, it, hits into pl it goes into plastic, collides with some stuff and stops. Um, um, I think actually it's that stopping uh, which produces the light. Um, anyway, it's a different topic. So you get the you get the light from the stopping of the muon, and then the muon actually like sort of explodes into a bunch of other stuff, uh, part of which is light. Um, so that's another flash. So first you stop the mu muon, muon, <laughs> the muon, uh, and then you get the muon decays. They don't always decay right away, but uh, there's a distribution. <laughs> muon decays. Um, and let's say it decays at some unknown time, uh, T0 plus 
delta t. Okay, and this also gives you another flash. So the experimenter sets up this apparatus and just measures uh, flashes uh, in their detector that are relatively close to each other. Um, and then you have to do a bunch of stuff to kind of isolate other things that might trigger flashes in the detector so that you're not getting uh, like spurious measurements from other effects. Um, and so you get, as a result, a whole bunch of pairs of flashes. Um, and then let's say you make a plot of these pairs of flashes uh, how many, like, you, you accumulate them over time. I maybe run this experiment for months or whatever, or days. I think I did it for days. Um, and you get some total collection, a large number of, of uh, pairs of flashes, so mu ones that you caught. Um, and then let's say you make a plot, and let's say you make a plot of the total number of flash pairs that you caught over time. All right, so this is time. And then the vertical axis... So this is number of, as a function of t. And so let me say what this is in words, actually. I need a little bit more space. Hmm. Move this guy down here. I don't like crossing those line breaks, but what the heck. Um, so we'll say n of t, this guy is equal to, it's the number of flash pairs. Uh, with delta t less than t. Right, so delta t is this parameter that's up here. It's the time, so it's the increment, or sorry, it's the interval, right, between the first flash and the second flash. All right, and so n of t is the number of flash pairs that you got with delta t less than little t. And so there's some total number, oops, like this. And as you increase t, uh, so this is t, um, you're making that, that uh, you're making more and more of your flash pairs now count because delta t is, get, is smaller than this little t as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what you see is a curve that looks kind of like this. And it goes asymptotically up to whatever is the total number you had, so the total number of flash pairs that you observed. So this is, goes asymptotically up to that, whatever that total is that you got. Now, if you think about it, so, so the claim is uh, that this is a Poisson process. Right, and therefore, what do you think that thing should look like? So, well, n of t, it's the number of flash pairs with delta t less than t. Well, what is the probability that delta t is less than t? So delta t is like the sojourn time, right? It's the time it takes uh, to increment, right? The time it takes to increment your n of t. Um, and so, this should be 1 minus the probability of delta t uh, being less than little t is 1 minus e to the minus lambda t. Right, that we worked out that before. And so this n of t should be n total times that. All right, if you multiply n total times the probability, you get n of t. So that's the idea of the experiment. So you measure this, uh, you collect all this data, and you can then, you do, you do this uh, data analysis, and what you do is you measure lambda. Right, so that's the thing that you measure. And you say that it must be the case that, so lambda is sort of the rate at which these things increment, it must be um, the case that one over lambda is like the lifetime of the muon, All right? So we say the so observation result uh, 
uh, the lifetime of the muon, tau, t of muon lifetime, uh, this should be 1 over lambda. And so if you do this, and you make the measurement, which is what I did, and, but I didn't invent it. This is some historical experiment. Um, I think I did this in the early 2000s, around two, I think I did it in 2000. Um, uh, but the experiment was done long, long before that. Um, the interesting and sort of weird result is that you get, you find that this is about 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And what's strange about that is if you go back here and look at this and say, well, look, how come these muons traverse? They, they were born up here. They come down somewhere at the top of the atmosphere. I don't know. You have some rough idea of how high up that is, um, where collisions would start to happen frequently. Um, and then it traverses this whole length here in 10 to the minus 5 seconds. Right. So 10 to the minus 5, that's 10 muon lifetimes according to this measurement down here. So how come, so what does that mean? So, so this is 10 to the minus six seconds. This is about one tenth of the falling time. And so that's sort of weird. It suggests that, so all these particles, they hit the atmosphere, they cruise on down for a while, 10 times this number that we observe for how long they last once they stop in the detector. And they stop in the detector and they die, uh, they disappear in, t in a time that's 10 times shorter than the amount that they journeyed. So it's sort of like the particle's life, if you say it started up at the top of the atmosphere, its lifetime was 10 to the minus 5 seconds, plus this tiny, tiny amount of time once it actually stopped. And so what is going on? Why is it that it has this tiny amount of existence after it stopped? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and so the resolution actually to this problem, uh, so that this seems to be a sort of odd. Why do they always disappear almost immediately um, when you get them by comparison to the amount of time that they were falling? Um, and I'll just tell you what the resolution is. It's kind of neat. So the resolution, if you don't know this stuff, um, is the fact that the muons were traveling really fast. So it's, it's relativity or special relativity. Um, so, so the muon speed is close to the speed of light. And as a result, this is the sort of mind-blowing result, as a result, time goes slower <laughs> in the muon's uh, frame of reference. So time compared to what it does in the lab. Time is slow for the falling muon. But once it stops, and it's in the same frame of reference as you, um, time speeds up back to its normal uh, kind of rate, and the muon's lifetime is revealed as this really, really tiny amount of time. Um, yeah, anyway, so I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, the experiment is fun for physicists. Um, if you're just interested in the statistics, though, um, this might be kind of an interesting thing to see. Like, how is it that we go from, you know, this cartoon of a particle and all that sort of stuff uh, how do we get to there from, you know, these abstract things? Where was it? Where did we see this sojourn time? Yeah, this thing here. So we've got this, you know, where, how does that thing manifest in this something useful for a, a, a physicist or some other kind of person dealing with a real, uh, real data or a real problem? Okay, I hope there was a little bit of something for everyone in there as we journeyed through our discovery of the Poisson process. <laughs> we got a little bit of uh, abstract proof. We got a little bit of holes in the proof for you to fill to hopefully uh, enjoy as a challenge. And uh, we got a little bit of a funny uh, uh, experiment or uh, application to physics. All right, I'll see you guys next time.